should probably actually intro it and start talking about it instead. Okay, I'll, I'll, should I do the intro? Um, yeah, I think that makes the most sense I don't, for this I, one. I feel like it's my turn, but I don't know. I feel like it makes it more doesn't. sense for you to intro this one. Okay. I forget how we intro anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, welcome to the latest episode of Never Stay Dead. Dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Ooh, special effects. I am Damien. Your co-host and my fellow co-host is Matt. Say hi, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. <laughs> or Matthew, I guess. Should I? I, I call you Matt. Actually. I call me Matt. It's fine. Okay. The great and powerful Matt. And tonight we are going to talk about three uh, super well-known issues of the Fantastic Four. Number 48, 49, and 50 which is sometimes called the Galactus Trilogy. It dates back from, I believe, 1966. Um, and it is the introduction of Galactus, the introduction of the Silver Surfer. A lot of people think of it as the either the beginning of the peak of the Fantastic Four or the peak of the Fantastic Four run, the 100 issues that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee did together, 102 issues, I think and a kind of foundational aspect to the Marvel universe. Also features a lot of the of the Watcher. And la you may have heard our previous episode where we talked about the previous three or four issues um, where that featured the beginnings of the uh, Inhumans in the Marvel universe. So Matt, I had this idea that we would give out prizes. And I have prizes. cleverly named the prizes. <laughs> what kind of glorious prizes are we handing out to these lucky individuals? Anyone who uh, gives us some kind of shout out that we notice or does us a good deed in some fashion will receive, not in the mail, not coming to them right away, the Never Stay Dead No Prize. Um, a completely original concept uh, that I just came up with. We were on. Um, we were guests on another podcast uh, a while back. Since our last, since the last podcast we've done, um, on Long Box Review, and so we'd like to grant our first never stay no prize to um, Eric of the Long Box Review for being such a wonderful guy and uh, devoting a whole episode to talk about us. Right. In our podcast. That was real fun and that was good. And in a lot of ways, because of our frequency, I want to treat that as like a unofficial never stay dead episode. <laughs> yeah, it was I mean, it was uh it was, it's I we'll put a a link somewhere for it because it's a great way to find out what what we think we're up to, to to whatever degree we actually know what we're up to. Because uh, that was what Eric was really trying to I find mean, out. I mean, we basically landed on a couple dudes talking about comics back and forth and <laughs> letting the friendship grow, which I think is uh, simple and but, noble enough of endeavor. And our concept of picking a few issues or a, a single story to discuss at a time and how we basically take turns discussing, uh, pick, picking what we'll discuss. Yeah. So this week, this week, this podcast uh, was picked by me because I'm a huge fan or think I'm a huge fan of the early Fantastic Four days with Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. All right. So there is Eric and who else is? I also want to send out in no time another no prize and never stay no prize to George of the George and Tony podcast, who was a guest on another of uh, Long Box Reviews episodes where he kind of shouted us out and mentioned how much he enjoyed listening to the podcast that we were on <laughs> and saying nice things about our podcast. And that means something. <laughs> okay. I've, I don't know George and Tony very well, but I've heard nothing but upstanding things. And I've slowly become more familiar with them and their uh -huh. comic podcasting legacy. Right. Their podcast no longer exists. And it was only sometimes about comics, but I discovered the George and Tony podcast through a uh, long box review. Right. So um, anyway, he's a great guy. And finally, on a YouTube a YouTuber shouted out our um, podcast. So 
Carlos Infante get also gets a never stay no prize in the mail or not in the mail coming not right away. Right, our no prizes really are no <laughs> prizes at all. Right. Not even an envelope. And then did Marvel eventually actually send people like empty envelopes or pieces of paper saying you want to know? That's what it was. It was an envelope with a stamp. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I think at first they just sent them. They didn't send them anything. It was no prize, right? Oh, I I I thought they got the envelope. Sending it to them, or did they always send people an envelope? My understanding was that it was the envelope, but uh, my understanding is shaky at best on this one. If I knew I would have gotten an envelope, I would have tried harder to get a no prize. And I have one to hand out as well. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes, to my, my buddy uh, Tony, the goddamn milkman who... Or not the goddamn milkman, <laughs> that's me. He's the goddamn Batman on the video game <laughs> side of things. Uh, he filled me in on a little bit of trivia about the uh, comics we're about to read that I was unaware of. Oh, what's and that? And we went to check it out. That initially, uh, the Silver Surfer was just drawn in by Kirby and... Stanley didn't know what to make out of it. Jack Kirby said, I was just tired of drawing spaceships. So I wanted to do something else. <laughs> and Stanley said, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And he said, that's your job. Figure it out, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and and that is that is Stanley's story that he's told over and over and over about this. Right. It's hard to believe, though, when you see uh, how the Silver Surfer comes into the story. So, Right. The Silver Surfer is such a major player. I think the truth, I, my guess is the truth is by this point, he and Stan Lee, Jack Kirby and Stan Lee would basically have a very brief conversation where they said, well, I have this idea for this uh, world planet eater coming in. And Stan Lee would say, okay, go run with that. And then he probably didn't even know who Galactus was or anything until Jack Kirby sent back the pages. That's my guess. I, I makes about as much sense as anything. <laughs> and that would explain the wacky way this is set up, where the conclusion to the previous story is on page seven, and at the bottom of page seven, the Galactus Silver Surfer story begins. And then the story ends in the middle of issue 50. And at the end of issue, the second half of issue 50 is just like, the FF returning back to their regular lives. So it all seems extremely improvised by the artist who could do anything he wanted. And he just did what he felt like. (laughs) Right. And there's a, that lack of structure really kind of plays into how this reads and how this feels. Cause it, right. It's so, you never know quite what to make of it because you're kind of thrust into it. And then you have one issue and then it just kind of ends. Right. And so calling it a Very trilogy roughly. is funny because it's really right. closer to two issues. It is. It, 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 if it properly structured, it should have fit into two issues. Right. Um, so, well, let me back up a little bit. A little bit. You, you had never read this story before. No. Most of my early but fantastic you, reading is what we've done on this podcast. So right. I am wholly agree. But you've certainly encountered the Silver Surfer and Galactus before, right? I, to some and degree. The Watcher, I assume. Right, mostly in um, Hickman's Fantastic Four. Uh huh. So you you weren't encountering these characters for the first time. And the part of, like, I kind of encountered them for the first time in reprints of this. But I very quickly encountered them in other things. Like, I think right. I, I almost immediately read a later, a later Galactus story which where he had a different um he had a different herald named gabriel who blew his horn <laughs> and to announce the coming of galactus <laughs> well i mean how far can you really dig into marvel without running across the silver surfer galactus right. i mean as far as players in the marvel universe go there's bigger to be sure but the this is a pretty definitive b tier kind of thing like you can right. only get so far before running into this Right. So when you read when you read issues like this, it's a question of do you try to put yourself in a historical perspective of this is when this began? Or do you try to or you or you can do both these things or do you kind of compare to where it where it went later on? 
uh, in the versions that you're more familiar with now. I couldn't help drawing comparisons. What was interesting for me is there's a handful of things that I really thought were handled better here than where I feel like the characters ended up. And oh, really? Okay. There was a handful of things that I'm glad they changed. <laughs> Well, let's get to that in a little bit. I'll just say for anyone who hasn't read this but is listening to this podcast, I think you should go out and read this. Find, there's lots of ways to read it. But um, <clears throat> the basic plot is as the Fantastic Four returns from their adventure with Inhumans in the Great Refuge coming back to New York, uh, the Silver Surfer is flying around multiple galaxies as he approaches Earth. Um, I say that with sarcasm in my voice because galaxies are very very far apart but um anyway and he you know the Cree he passes by the Cree empire and they kind of freak out and then weird events start happening on earth um like two suns appear in the sky and then fire flame fills the air and then kind of rock like platelets cover the sky and this is all to block Earth from the view of the Silver Surfer. It's being done by the Watcher. I'm, I'm really skipping over things quickly here. And then the Watcher reveals to the Fantastic Four that Galactus is coming. And that's what the Silver Surfer means. The Silver Surfer arrives on top of the Baxter building conveniently and sends out his signal to Galactus before they can stop him. Galactus is the world devourer. And Ben Grimm knocks the Silver Surfer off the building. And what happens next? Then Galactus arrives, and then later we see the Silver Surfer randomly falling into Ben Grimm's girlfriend Alicia's apartment. Right. She teaches the Silver Surfer about humanity and that every life matters. And meanwhile, the Watcher, the Fantastic Four kind of attempt to fight Galactus, and the Watcher who never interferes with mankind, interferes and sends Johnny Storm through time and space and alternate dimensions to a gigantic space station where a secret weapon exists that can stop Galactus. And in the meantime, before he comes back, the Silver Surfer decides to fight for humanity against Galactus because Alicia taught him to have a soul or something. And um, so more fighting with Galactus ensues until Johnny Storm arrives back with this incredible gizmo that is just looks like a fancy futuristic uh, big lighter or something. <laughs> and they hold it up to Galactus and he freaks out. And how did you humans get that? Uh, some conversations between Galactus there and Summer Surfer and, uh, and the Watcher. And Galactus goes away promising not to eat Earth. So, uh, yes. So that's my very, I don't want to spend a large part trying to summarize everything. We can go back through and hit on points that interest us. Right. What were you going to say, Matt? No, I mean, that that's your brief version. But I, 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 the easy way to go through this is to start peeling back layers of the onion. But I want to point out something relatively close to the beginning. Um, yes. First of all, to, for us to um, more meta textually have some grounding on Galactus and what a big threat he is. I don't know how big the scrolls were at this point in Marvel, right. but I getting the feeling they were kind of just, you know, on some level the the big green bad men from space, but they were kind of known to be the they look like just your stock standard. Yeah, aliens. they they've attacked a few times, but individual like they sent four scroll agents who right. the FF eventually trick into turning into cows. And then that cow the cows go and get eaten and you get the skull kill crew and Hooray for Marvel. Really? And oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. The, that's an interesting continuity thing because in the very first comic I ever read, those four cows come back oh. in in 1970. That's... So I don't know how they got turned back into cows again and then eaten by the skull kill. Uh, maybe I misunderstood, but I seem to recall that from my wizard magazines back in the day. No, it, it may well have happened. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's uh, in, off. In any case... And, and th so the Skrulls have appeared a couple of times. The Super Skrull appeared once at this point okay. um, and almost defeated the Fantastic Four. But there's been no Skrull invasions on a large scale. But <clears throat> they're the little green men from space. They're the big bad guys. You don't really right. even need to know that. And 
that there's just two panels, but the amount they do with these two panels is kind of funny to me because it's just like bumbling bureaucracy. This one guy being right. Silver Surfer Galactus. What's that? You idiot. Don't you know? Yada, yada, cosmic consequences. What? And they move right on from that. And it's just like, oh, okay. They're really setting that this is big, that this is a big deal, which is really cool but it's kind of funny coming right off of the inhumans where it's like well, there's this other big deal now there's this other big deal for some reason right. it, it sells but it doesn't feel like it should uh, um they spend well i think as often as the case well I, I think actually stan lee helped sell it too but i think there's an intensity it's like you're you're bombarded one thing after another but it's done in such a way that it feels like, oh, my God, I'm so, well, if I were a kid, so emotionally worn out by what just happened to Johnny Storm losing the love of his life. And wham, the Earth's about to get destroyed. And uh, and this is a bigger menace than now. I kind of reg a bigger menace than we'd ever seen before, I think, in the Marvel Universe at this in 1966 or 65. Right. But uh, now I'm very tired of these giant cosmic menaces. Well, but uh, I, there, there's this thing, but the idea of this cosmic threat coming in is um, heralded kind of the way like a big demon coming into Stormily normally does. You know, like there's right. two suns in the sky. There's there's all this crazy stuff going on that's just happening because of his coming. A and that sort of build is, you know, when it's played right, is interesting and a bit more downplay because it's not like some gauntlet of villains they had to go through right it's like biblical signs in the sky right for the end of the world and uh, and we're shown people in new york city rioting and freaking out and i wanted to point that out because there's one page in particular that really did something for me that went beyond just the page and colored the rest of the story for me and johnny's dealing with some thug on the street right and the thing goes to deal with it and this guy goes to punch him and basically breaks his hand on the thing and the thing just flicks him and knocks him out right like, with one finger right he's holding back like he's doing like the least amount he can to just just knock this guy out he realized he's being a goon this this one bubble he has right after it was my favorite part you could sleep it off here, pal. Be snapping out of it in a couple hours. Then think of all the fun you'll have in the emergency ward telling everybody what a phony I am. Like, he knows this guy <laughs> is just going to be a jerk and he's being as kind as he can about right. it. Like, he's such a hero doing it, but this guy's also so beneath him. And it's like this superhero dynamic on a great level. But it's also setting up this fact that the Fantastic Four are kind of above mere mortals. Uh -huh. In the best yeah. way possible, yeah. but they are. Right. And they know what it's like to be mere mortals, but they're above them now. Right. Which sets up the power struggle of what's to come in a way that helps sell the whole story, I think. Yeah. Well, there's to me when I was a kid, I can this scene, you know, where the city's in flames and a mob shoots uh, a hose at, J at Johnny Storm and puts out his flame and he's fighting the mob and. Ben Grimm jumps off their flying motorcycle and lands on the ground. It, to me, it was an ex extremely intense scene as a kid. Um, it really pumped up the volume long before Galactus shows up to just... All the details here painted very quickly, you know, in a few pages. Really, at least when I was a child and when this stuff was new to me, really ramped it up very quickly and very effectively. Yeah. Um, then we move on to, I, I posted a couple of things on Twitter last night when I was reading this, but, uh, I think I saw one of them or maybe it's just one, but it, there's this whole bit with Sue and Reed and their marital <laughs> strife that, uh, this part doesn't play anymore. Uh, -huh. I, I think that's probably the best known part of old fantastic four is how goofy and semi misogynistic right. this all looks now. Although later in the in the trilogy, I think by the in the last issue, Sue is responding very angrily to Reed at this point. And so that gives it an edge of I thought, but this never happens during the Kirby Lee run. But I thought 
this if you read right then and you were an adult you'd say okay this relationship is leading to an exploding point they're going to get divorced or there's going to be a huge kind of meritable difficulty between them which did happen later under other writers but not under stan lee but it seemed like there was a moment there where stan lee was thinking okay this behavior is not acceptable and a wife is not going to put up with this Um, right there is lots of other sexist stuff because sue is always afraid and worried and not wanting to fight yeah i mean here she's not afraid but she wants to fight about the fact he didn't have dinner and hasn't shaved like it's right it's like sitcom fodder but played like pure melodrama and it's weird and then we get the watcher here and the watcher uh put on some weight (laughs) he was kind of a skinnier dude with a big head earlier and now he's a a fat guy with the head now being a little more proportionate to his body yeah, it looks a little, uh, um, what's the, Orson Welles-ish. Uh, I wonder if he's also supposed to be kind of like one of those fat Buddhas. Yeah. Instead of meditating, he watches. <laughs> yeah, he's played very somberly here, which is... Right. I mean, maybe not that well, far Well, he's off. also kind of like a biblical character of, you know, sending out warnings and yeah, stuff. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, it's not that weird. I'm just coming off of uh, Spider-Gwen, where the Watchers were a different take. <laughs> um, yeah, and then... I think I, it's only later that we learn that there's a whole race of Watchers and all of that kind of stuff. At this point, the Watcher seems like a singular being who's known to Galactus... You know, one amongst a few cosmic beings who all know each other. Right. Um, And then moving forward very quickly, I just want to start talking about some of the designs because Silver Surfer just looks like a silver dude on a surfboard. It's relatively cool. Mm -hmm. But we get this panel with him where he starts shooting like energy and he looks like it looks like it's all kind of inward and whatnot. It looks really dynamic is that oh that's the one where he shoots off the signal to galactus on the page yeah um yeah that's a very intense picture i've never seen the surfer done like this in a way it just made me love the design more it took something that's relatively simple and it's just because it doesn't matter but it's just like all this pure energy and oh man yeah it's like he's he's just a container of energy in a way i this panel alone makes me want to go read more silver surfer like <laughs> i i can't quite describe how much this panel just kind of caught me off guard and i i haven't had something like where i just stared at it like that in a while it... one of the supposedly one of the nails in the coffin of stan lee um, of jack kirby being mad at stan lee and leaving marvel was kirby invented the silver surfer and it's pretty well reflected in this in these issues that Kirby's idea of the Silver Surfer as a a very alien figure you know who just barely understands humanity or anything and then when Jack Kirk when Stan Lee decided to give the Silver Surfer his own comic he didn't involve Jack Kirby and he transformed the Silver Surfer into more of what Kirby thought of as kind of this suffering messianic figure who ended up being kind of whiny and um always complaining about humanity and stuff so that's where dan slot got the idea that he was doctor who basically (laughs) i well i i I feel dan slot's silver surfer is different from both of those but um um yeah i just want to note because i found out uh so dan slot's like first comics were these reprinted I right, that recently. right. I just thought that was an interesting little tidbit. Well, and they were reprinted a number of times. I mean, they were frequently reprinted. Um, right. Because I stumbled across them, and then I've seen them in Treasury editions and other other of the sort. Right. Other things of that sort. But it wasn't so easy to get hold of things. I, I feel like I was lucky that it was being reprinted around the time that I was able to buy, starting to be able to buy more comics. Gotcha. Um, then I have to ask at the end of this issue, we get the grand reveal of Galactus. <laughs> I have a theory there, but go ahead and say what you want to say about it. Well, 
the design here is similar to what it's carried through but i mm-hmm. the colorist either got it wrong or they saw it and decided to change it immediately after right i think the color is screwed up okay does he even have the giant g oh yeah he still has the giant g but in the very next issue it's all purple well, it's not all purple but it's purple and red but his his legs are bare right what we should say which i think seems like another mistake because by the next issue his legs are not bare we should say um in this initial appearance he's green and red right which so there just was not uh, probably in the next issue stan lee said hey wait a minute these don't seem like good colors i uh i didn't know i cared so much about how galactus looks but this threw me <laughs> off this really like pulled me out i <laughs> i didn't know what to make of it it's particularly bad in the coloring of his helmet where it's part red and part green it makes it look very odd but yeah, we get to the next issue, and it's purple and red. And the Watcher and Galactus are talking, and I, I don't know how to put it. it like, after all this buildup, Galactus just seems like a really big guy with some superpowers. He doesn't seem like right. Galactus to me. Because he's giant, but he's giant in the way of, like, giants were in, like, I don't know, not even Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, a really tall guy... But like, you know, eight in fairy tales, maybe. Yeah, like eight foot, you know, not like oh, skyscraper. No, sort of, he looks like he's about, I don't know, 20 feet tall, I think, or 15, 16. I don't know. He's like two things. The thing comes up to about his uh, but... shorts. <laughs> he's maybe two and a half. Things. To be fair, his shorts are uh, short, so it's. Uh... Yeah, they're short shorts. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not intimidating. It was very fashion forward in 1966. <laughs> I can't. I don't know what it is. Like I know Galactus has always had the. Or, I mean, to my view, Galactus has always had the mouth part. But something about the short shorts just. <laughs> took, I, I can't. He looked too much. By like mouth a part, dude. you mean the part of his helmet that goes right up underneath his, or right over his chin and underneath his mouth. Right. So you, so you can tell it's like yeah. supposed to be a white guy under there, which makes no sense. If right. ever there was a time to pull the Spider-Man mask, anything could be under there. It's Galactus. You yes. should wonder. But it, what's funny too is like they have this planet eater and. It's not some super alien thing. It's almost more bizarre and surreal that it's a guy in a goofy costume. <laughs> yeah, you know, it it feels like they're still just drawing supervillains, even though if you read the script, he's not a supervillain. He's a he's a god or a, a demon. <laughs> You know, an anti god. <laughs> right. Um but to Jack Kirby saying Silver Surfer's supposed to be an alien, like he the thing punched him off a building and then he just you see him like fumbling towards Alicia's window. Right. I don't know what's supposed to be going on there. Like, as much as I like this, this is one moment of storytelling that I feel is lost. Especially in the super compressed storytelling. Like, I, I don't Well, there's know. incredible amounts of inconsistency because the Watcher has previously told them that that punch off the building is nothing to him, like a tickle by, with a feather. Right. But then when he lands in Alicia's apartment, he's kind of dazed and half unconscious at first. And so she has to comfort him. It's because the Watcher has never been punched by the thing, so he doesn't know. That's probably right. wrong. That's probably dead wrong. I don't... It's it's because uh, <laughs> well you could say that I think it's you know it's because of the process again that Stan Lee wrote one thing and Jack Kirby wasn't reading what Stan Lee wrote <laughs> and then the next issue comes along and Stan Lee has to write something else to explain why things are happening that way right um, but at least so this is the churning point of the story right here. Alicia yes. talks to the Silver Surfer, who's given like some plates of food to make him feel better, and he absorbs it all. 
like with as pure energy right and then they go into this whole philosophical thing of her pointing at, like you said you know all life matters and all that and what i find kind of weird though is he points out like oh you can't see all humans afflicted by this it, it, just get this feeling like he could have let her see i don't know right he probably could magically make her see right and i was just like that didn't even come up i don't know it just felt right weird but he doesn't care he doesn't have any uh context so he doesn't necessarily think it's a bad thing she can't see i suppose um why he you know it's like he's never talked to an another inferior alien before so he's shocked to discover oh they have feelings and stuff and so suddenly he turns around and changes his whole approach which we'll find out later is the furthest thing from the truth but later when when you hit the backstory on his wife and uh, him becoming the oh right 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 that was not a backstory that they envisioned at the time Oh, certainly that's stan lee came up with that later on when he wanted to you know make it less a jack kirby character and more a stan lee character oh so jack kirby was so bitter about stan lee taking away his favorite character and not even letting him be the artist on it that that was like the one of the beginnings of him thinking of leaving marvel basically the same reason dicko left yeah in a way yeah um although i don't you know i always think that dick ho got plotting credit and stan and jack kirby didn't i think kirby should have just asked to get plotting credit but that's a whole nother i mean i i don't there are people who have done work kind of rediscovering what was going on in the marvel offices at the time i don't know it as well as them but i've heard them speak and from what I can tell is there are some crazy power dynamics and making an ask like that of Stan Lee was more than a risky move. And for even Jack Kirby, it could have been viewed as career suicide and to the point where he got frustrated and just decided to do his own thing. So I don't know that as much as we love a lot of the comics yeah. that came out, there is some stuff going on in that office. Well, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it wasn't really in the office. Jack Kirby wasn't in the office. Well, um, there was the whole illusion of there being this bullpen, but there wasn't. It was just Stanley and his secretary. <laughs> um, right. And so, I don't There's some other parts of the story, and they're interesting, but it really comes down to, to me, like, this turning point, the Silver Surfer is the main thing, and then there's some super heroics that involve the Fantastic Four, but the Watcher sends off the human torch to go get this thing which to me looking back is super weird because the empty void of space that has no oxygen he is able to go fly burning yes but a fire hose puts his fire out yeah i know Uh, uh i suppose you could rationalize that the watcher not only was guiding him telepathically but was also sort of enveloping him in some kind of safe little pocket of oxygen that he could fly along then he through. could have sent anyone <laughs> i know he said that johnny storm was the only one he could send because he was the only one who could get through safely with his flying abilities right so but on the other hand that sequence is really cool especially it's pretty if 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 you were coming fresh to this as kind of a cosmic landscape and a cosmic perspective you know there's that whole in science fiction, they talk about the sense of wonder, and this this series of events is full of sense of wonder, bigger, built on bigger, built on bigger, that if you come to it when you're not used to all this stuff, I think is very powerful, which is, what, in my opinion, why it, why this has you know become a pivotal moment in people's memories of the development of the Marvel Universe. It's when the vistas really got big. It was kind of a genie they couldn't put back in the bottle in a way. Um, but so, like you said, the Human Torch comes back with this ultimate nullifier. Oh, right. Ultimate nullifier, yes. Uh, which I'm pretty sure comes up later. Does it? 
I was shocked because I didn't remember this that they give the ultimate nullifier to Galactus after he agrees to leave. Yeah. Um, but to me, like that whole bit felt like, yeah, they had to work at the Fantastic Four, but this really felt like the Silver Surfer's story and his coming around is really the story and it really makes him the protagonist in my mind i felt there was the silver surfer story but if you read even deeper there's kind of a there's a lot of conversations between galactus and the watcher and it's almost a story about you know if you read into it a story about their changing relationship the shock that the watcher would finally I mean, now we're used to the Watcher interfering all the time. <laughs> but the shock that the Watcher would stand up for these puny little creatures. And he and Galactus clearly know each other and have all kinds of backstory. Yeah. Th there's... But there's also a whole relationship between the Silver Surfer and Galactus that I found interesting, which I hadn't remembered. They clearly have this affection for each other, like in their alien, distant way. <laughs> and so it's a a tragedy for both of them in a way that the silver surfer turns against him and, and they can't be together anymore. Right. And it's played in a way that it isn't later. Like it, when they go, when they reference this later, it's written in a very yeah. different, more antagonistic way than this right. almost like, no, you're wrong. But yeah, the, that, that the silver said. surfer is almost like an angel working for someone he thought was God. And then he realizes this being is not God, is not all just, and and he turns against him. So he's almost like a reverse Lucifer. <laughs> Instead of falling from heaven, he's falling from evil. But but he still falls because he gets trapped on earth. A fate so terrible. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, and then it just kind of ends. Right. The <laughs> nullifier. So the, the, the Fantastic Four do not solve the problem. They are pawns of the Watcher who solves the problem. Right. So it's kind of like, I think I pointed out earlier when we were reading about the Black Panther, where that those issues seem like the Black Panther stories. These... It's not. It's hard to say whether it's the Silver Surfer story or Galactus and the Watcher story or all three of them, but it's not really the Fantastic Four story, right? Which I found crazy, especially because this is issue fifty, right? Which nowadays that that wouldn't fly. Um, that would be a special event issue, right? If they can, but even it makes me high. wonder if the charm of the Fantastic Four is the world they inhabit more than. I mean, they're interesting-ish characters, but it's not, they aren't the central focus. They're just part of everything. Right. They journey. And, and when you things. write, when other people write Fantastic Four and think it's all about Johnny Reed and Sue and Ben, and that's all it's about, it feels off. It doesn't feel like enough. Right. I mean, I they're the, they're the journey. They're kind of Star Trek, you know, they get, right. take you to some story, some world, and that story in that world is the story, but you have these consistent characters that build and grow through, but they're sometimes the story pulls away from them because it's really about whatever other character. And in this case, right. it's really about Galactus and Silver Surfer, these two other characters they pulled in that their breaking up allows the earth to live. Like in some ways, this story would be more interesting without the fantastic four, maybe, or maybe be a little too simple. I don't know. I guess, but it has interesting ramifications for the Fantastic Four. Like, as I said before, it felt like in the wake of this, Sue was about ready to break up with Reed, I thought, but if they don't go there. But then also, um, Ben now has a problem because he thought that Alicia cared more about the Silver Surfer than him. And, and, and Johnny, again, this is a thread that's dropped, but John, Johnny's gone through this mind-bending, almost religious experience through the travels through the cosmos that he's been put through by the watcher. And so he's all distracted and regular. It's he's having this weird feeling of going to college when he's had all these amazing things happen to him. And now he's just starting at college. So I like that it plays in 
the events they live through play into their lives. I wish it did. I wish they did it even better. I wish they followed through more over time. But um, well, and it's I, funny you bring. Th- it. I feel that's why they resonate for me as characters in these books, because they do have lives going on and emotions that are affected by these big events. You know, in a way, the Inhuman story is mostly about the Inhumans. You know, about Maximus and about about um, the royal family and their struggles with Maximus. But we still have that emotional connection because Johnny falls in love with Crystal and then loses her. And As shallow as their love was portrayed. But. Well, but I mean, and also, like, we get a couple issues away from it, but they come back to it, so it's lasting in a way. So just the right. time put in has some effect. But it's funny you mention that because something was also stolen from me because the cover of 50 has the startling saga of the silver surfer and then they have a little box at last the human torch in college it's kind of like oh well i guess everything works out yeah. then that that's a very odd <laughs> editorial choice to put that and that looks like the kind of thing that stan lee came back and said well i think you better put this box in here showing that there's more than just the silver surfer right I have read that early on they always thought that the breakaway character was Johnny Storm because he was a teenager. They thought that's who their readers were most interested in, even though everyone was most interested in the thing. So it took them a long time to take the focus off of Johnny Storm. That might be even why they chose Johnny to be the one to go get the ultimate nullifier, since that's the only semi-important thing that anyone in the Fantastic Four did in this story. Even though in a lot of ways, the Invisible Girl would have made a lot more sense. I've always fantasized of a Fantastic Four where the Invisible Girl takes over as the leader and and utilizes her all her force fields and powers more aggressively. I mean, I think John Byrne and maybe a few other writers tried to give her bigger roles, but I still feel that you could turn her character on its head a bit and make her sort of the aggressive, no-nonsense adult in the whole group i agree um there's definitely something to that and she's a character i've heard a lot of different takes on and yeah i don't know if she's ever really fully gotten her due i think writers generally have over over time like at first it was they thought it was most about human torch and everything but by the and then the thing became very popular but I think writers writing the Fantastic Four always think that Reed Richards is the central character. And so they always come back to that. And again, that might be a little bit of a mistake. He may not be as central a character as he seems. But, that was the or, crutch of Hickman's run. Is It, it was right. barely about the rest of the characters. And not only yeah. was it Reed Richards, it was about this pantheon of Reed Richards. Of Reed Richards, And right. that got tired fast because he's not so great. Yeah. I enjoyed it, but I do think it it's not the approach I would take for sure or that I want to see continued on. It would have been fun. It if brought it... the pantheon of Reed Richards back in Marvel 2 and 1 in the annual that just came out a few weeks ago. Thanks, Chip. <laughs> I liked it, but yeah, I, it worried me that that would become the focus again. As someone who's been more or less signed on to read all of Chip Zdarsky's work, I uh-huh. uh, could do with less of it. Ha- have you read... Have you been following his Marvel 2 and 1? I have. Uh, um, it's stronger than his Spectacular Spider-Man, but it is still not... Like, Dan Slaw came and did one issue of the Fantastic Four that I thought was infinitely better than all of 2 and 1 in one go. And I don't know if you've had a really? chance to wow. read... Uh... I, I still have not received my copy because okay. that's coming in the mail today. Oh, right. Well... Because of my cheaping out on Marvel Comics no. and getting them through uh, these mail subscriptions... So because of the mail subscription, I won't have to pay the double cover price or anything like that. I just get 12 issues for the price. Well, that's good. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. I was surprised. I thought you didn't like it from a comment on Twitter, but then you told me later you did like it. So I'm looking forward to see it. I wish I had received it by now because it would have been fun to discuss that. Yeah. Um, some other time. This podcast, but some other time. And there won't be a lot to talk about till they get a few more issues in, at least. If you were, if I were to sum up my feelings about this now, having probably read it for the sixth or seventh time in my life, okay. Um, <laughs> but not, 
I haven't I haven't read it in a number of years. I would I now view it as a, a failure as a story because we kind of struggle to say who is the story about. And but a, a whole bunch of incredible scenes and moments. I still felt the thrill of Earth under attack with the flames and the rocks and those scenes we talked about with Johnny and the thing I found sort of moments of thrills where they were fighting Galactus and cool moments here and cool moments there. And so I just feel like it's loaded with cool stuff, but it's not a story that someone sat back and figured out the proper story to tell. They just were throwing out cool ideas. And I think in many places, Stan Lee did some good writing of catching that sort of cosmic feeling and everything especially for someone who has no understanding of astronomy as Stan Lee does not. But. Well, yeah, I agree. So if you step back from this story in a way and you read it fast enough that you don't let your head catch up to your heart, as it were, right? it's a really fun read. And when you start trying to pick it apart, you know, some things don't work out. Some things aren't as great right. as they could be, but that's not what this is. This is soft sci-fi. This is fun. This is a lot of creative ideas getting thrown against the wall and putting right. them th in a through line. And I, I think it's a really fun, really interesting, really great window to a different time in comics where nowadays when we talk about there's all these expectations and all this loaded nonsense in some ways that I think we all would do good to step back from from time to time. <laughs> right. But God, this was fun and it was a good time to read. And yeah, it doesn't fully work. And I think there's something to be said for stepping back and making some of the stuff work. But I think there's also a lot more to be said to look at this and say, this is fine. This is good. And just let comics be fun. Right. And it, and if you have an art a really good artist, it gave this good artist a chance to draw some really cool pictures. Right. Um, I will say this though: the fact that it's so highly regarded as part of this run is uh -huh. a little baffling to me, because a lot of that wonder and fun I got from the following stuff that we already talked about a little bit. We skimmed over it, but I mean, this man, this monster, how can you not? Right. Um, and then the Black Panther stuff. I just. I think it just got its reputation because at the moment, all those people following Marvel Comics, this was the issue that blew the top of their heads off. Right. And afterwards, they were kind of used to that. And I mean, Kirby and Lee or just by chance, probably, or were being smart. They did kind of quiet things down for an issue or two. Um, later, there's some really cool issues where or I remember them as being really cool issues where Dr. Doom steals the Silver Surfer's power. And so all kinds of fun, bombastic things happen there where Dr. Doom's flying around on a on the Silver Surfer's board and blasting everybody with cosmic energy. And <laughs> yeah, the power cosmic. Um, so I think that, that's another thing I like about Fantastic Four is the way it it would slow down and then get more intense and then slow down. But it's, yeah, it's of its, it's very much of its time. Um, I can get into the right frame of mind and then I kind of lose it at moments when the dialogue gets boring or something like that. It doesn't leave me excited to read Dan Slott's fan. I mean, you, you're saying it's good and it leaves me excited, but it doesn't <laughs> make me want to read a modern day version of, of these characters in a way. I just, I like with Spider-Man, both of them, I like them well enough in their Silver Age incarnations, and it, it's hard for me to move on from that. Well, time marches on, so it you does. might as well give it, it a shot. You had and I do read modern comics, but I know some people who just don't, um, and that's fine, but, but I am interested in modern comics, but it's harder for me with these characters that felt particularly emotionally strong even if the logic wasn't always there from the what from the 60s and early 70s and i heard uh recently mark wade in an interview going on about how these old comic book characters um 
have more weight put on them than any other fictional character. And trying to hold this through line of what these characters are true to versus telling new exciting stories with them is this incredible tightrope walk. And he said he's been in the room and it snaps sometimes. It doesn't work and they <laughs> have to reset and come back to it. And that's why there's this reset and all this, which was an interesting take. Um, I'm not sure if I believe in it as a lot of other things he said in that interview, I vehemently disagree with. And I think Mark Wade, uh, 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 is wrong on a lot of things. Do you remember where this interview was? Uh, yes, it was the most recent episode of the amazing spider talk. You can oh. go check that out. I was so trying Mark not Wade was to talking do a about plug. Spider-Man because has he ever ri- <laughs> written Spider-Man? I yes, he so. did. Uh, oh God, you're just throwing this to me. He did a graphic novel called amazing Spider-Man family business, which we covered on the what second or third episode of the untold docs of Spider-Man. We were not very big. Wait, fans. was that the one, the one where he finds out about his parents being spies or something? Well, like he that? finds out about his parents being spies in annual number five, way back when written by uh. Stanley. Um, but uh, this is the graphic novel where he finds out Mark Wade says he tries, tried to leave it ambiguous. He failed. Um, Spider-Man has a <laughs> sister. And the way it's written in that book, he has a sister. Um, right. That sounded horrible when you guys reviewed it. I forgot that it was by Mike, Mark Wade, but I did listen to that podcast. Yeah. Um, it's a, yeah, no, it's not. Certainly for Mark Wade's work, it is uh, below right. his par. Uh, and it. Mark Wade has been below and above his par many times. <laughs> he's not. He's not someone that you could say, oh, I'll read every Mark Wade comic and, and end up being happy. Oh, yeah. No, you're you're going to reach some interesting points in um, Kingdom Come, and then you're going to d- read some Daredevil, and then you're going to start reading some other stuff to start wondering if it's the same guy. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think he's at times been happy to just hack it out, and other times he's had, you know, something really clicked, and then it really worked. Yeah. Um, well, you know, any writer that's as prolific as he has been, uh, you know, is going to have their high points and their low points and different people are going to agree and disagree on some of that middle more so than the rest. But right. Uh, I, I can honestly say, having heard his opinion on a lot of things, I disagree with him on a lot of things. So you mean about superheroes Yeah, about or? superheroes, about how stories should be told, about the importance of these characters and their status quo in particular. Um, right. I don't want to dive too much into it, yeah. but well, but I'll always like Mark Wade for the good things I've read by him. And, and Daredevil was fairly recent. I've heard he has a really good um, Fantastic Four run, but one that he had to leave abruptly. Yeah. Um, and I forget the reason for that. I knew the reason at some point, but I don't either creative differences or they just kicked him off of it because they wanted someone else. But I can't remember. Right. I... So I've always meant to go read that run. It, it's drawn by Mike Rewengo, or however you say that name. And I, uh, whenever I've looked at his art, I've, I've never really read comics drawn by him. And his art is kind of extremely different from Jack Kirby's, let's say. And it, it's okay. disconcerting to see it done on the Fantastic Four. Well, were there any but I should give it a runs shot. of the Fantastic Four you enjoyed post Lee and Kirby? Well, I remember really enjoying... Um, john burns run okay um but i don't know if that would hold up if i went back and reread it i'm a little afraid to do that and (laughs) um i enjoyed jonathan hickman's run it it wasn't uh, i think i was able to separate myself there there was also you know bits and pieces in the 70s when people were trying to imitate jack kirby and stan lee where it kind of clicked for a while Um, There was an interesting short uh, George Perez run. There was parts of a Rick Buckler, Rich Buckler run that were good. Um, It's it's hard to have. It's hard to I'm nervous about going back to things that I liked in my teens or even early 20s sometimes. Really? But there's been a lot of bad Fantastic Four. I mean. Matt Fraction couldn't do it well. Um, uh, Mark Millar couldn't do it very well, although it was better than Matt Fraction. And um, James Robinson didn't seem to do it very well, but I didn't give him much of a chance. But I, 
I was pretty sure he wasn't doing it well. <laughs> okay. And I'm trying to think of who was doing it before Jonathan Hickman. Well, there was a Mark Millar run, and I don't know who came before Mark Millar. But... I think right before Hickman, I, I can't remember who was writing it, but that was when you had the not Fantastic Four, Fantastic Four with Storm and Black Panther oh. and some other characters. They think just... they're clever when they're doing that, but I just... I just have trouble buying into it. I was like, I want Storm. I want to see her in the X Men, not in the Fantastic. I bought in wholesale. I, I have that entire uh-huh. run, and it was, uh, it happened. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Black Panther. He's been in the Fantastic Four, and he's pretended to be Daredevil. For quite a while, they didn't know what to do with him, and they just stick him in things. <laughs> and now he's a worldwide phenomenon of a character, so right. they're going to have to make him work. Yeah, which has been interesting because um, what was it? Uh, one of the side books uh, just won an Eisner, if I understand correctly. Right, like Tales of Wakanda or something. I can't remember the exact title, but it was something about Wakanda. Big World of Wakanda, just those W's. Right. You got to work them in. And it it only lasted a few issues, I think, before Marvel canceled it. I thought it was a miniseries. So. Oh, I thought it was one of those things they canceled after a few issues. Oh, well, there's been a lot of that misunderstanding with Marvel. They really need to be more clear because there's a lot of hubbub around Iceman when uh, that was canceled. But it was only ever supposed to be that right. that run was what they agreed to. And they said, you know, if this sells well, it'll do, we'll do more. And then the trade sold well. So they're doing more. And now these people are harping uh-huh. on Marvel for bringing it back and uh it's as it was well agreed and, to be. and poor iceman is caught in the whole political well push and pull online between people who want to attack anything they perceive as being too liberal i yes and i'm not a fan of that but i will say the way that they made iceman gay was uh not ideal and i've even heard uh writers and editors talk about it since and say you know, just making him wholesale gay and not even just buy doesn't really make sense. And it was not handled yeah. well. Yeah. I and I certainly when I I never read any of that. But when I heard about it, I was like, eh, I, Iceman's gay. I don't really think that's a great idea. But but I'm not going to rant about it on a political level. I just think it was a maybe not the greatest story idea yeah no it was a miss a character idea it was a miss and a very bizarre well for x-men it was a point in the x-men where a thing happened and it was bizarre as right. with s- everything with x-men at some point <laughs> right well and there was a, a period i think where marvel thought a good way to juice sales was to flip characters in ways that people weren't expecting and it maybe worked for a while and then, like, everything got overplayed. And I don't know if Iceman's flipping came at a point where it was already kind of overplayed. Well, that and the way they did it was just yeah. less than. Well, because if, if you've just decided something's a formula, then you're hacking it out, right? You're just saying, okay, who else can we flip? Let's flip him, rather than it you know, being an important thing to do. But Right. But uh, after that, you know, uh, Sheena Grace taking on Iceman and all that, you know, there were those, those were some fun comics. So, oh, OK, you know, well, maybe I'll read them I, someday on Marvel Unlimited. Th- that's something that I have to remind myself of comics every now and again, kind of like when, you know, Fantastic Four maybe doesn't have the best, but then stuff comes later. I'd be curious to go and read some of this follow up Silver Surfer Galactus stuff, because I have a feeling my classic understanding of that story is more from those comics but right. you wouldn't have those comics without some of this crazy stuff that we just read with Galactus having a giant G and being a dude in short <laughs> shorts that causes there to be right. two suns in the sky. And it's just <laughs> like this ended up being fun, but sometimes you get some bad comics that set something up and then someone takes that and makes a good story. Right. Which right. I mean, that well, was Jeff John's Galactus career, is... right? Galactus has probably been used in every which way. Right. I mean, one thing I noticed here is they said this is the first inhabited planet that Galactus has tried to eat. Mm-hmm. And later on, we get the idea that Galactus has, you know, for thousands of years been going around and eating inhabited planets. And uh, in, in the Dan Slott Silver Surfer run, the Silver Surfer encounters all these different aliens who he has helped get eaten up so that all of that would have happened before the events of this Fantastic Four. Right. This story has been wholly retconned to the point where this story doesn't actually make right. sense in continuity. Um, 
I'm curious now. I'm wondering if there's a point where someone linked, uh, like, the Phoenix Force to something like Galactus, because you have all these cosmic destructive powers floating around. It feels like there'd be some clash or some avoidance or something. I don't something. know if it, if it's still part of the, the canon of who Galactus is, but a, a few years after this, they came up with the idea that Galactus was created to to cause the rebirth of a new universe after our universe is destroyed so that while he's this horrible destructive force now he's actually going to be a creative force that saves worlds in the long run so he's like a a, e, a evil that you have to accept because it's you know he's part of the great cycle of renewal that the universe has to go through is that where the marvel new universe came from I have no idea if they link that together. Okay. This this what this origin of him came in some issues of Thor when it was still Stanley and Jack Kirby doing it, and I think they continued to play on that. Like when um, in the Fantastic Four, the Shair Emperor Empire put Reed Richards on trial for not killing Galactus in some later story, and so I think because Galactus is so important to the universe as a whole, part of the ecosystem of the universe. Uh, in the end, they decided not to uh, ex- execute um, Reed Richards for having saved Galactus. <laughs> huh. And Wait. right now, I think they have a good Galactus who was part of the Ultimates in outer space for a while. Cool. I haven't read it, but I heard other people talking they about it. they got to stop making <laughs> villains heroes. That's ridiculous. The good Galactus was wearing like a golden outfit. Oh my god. Um... <laughs> So in the Thor issues, was Galactus kind of their Ragnarok idea? Kind of. So okay. he came from some ancient race, and his name was originally Galen or something. <laughs> came from this ancient super race who was finally being destroyed, and they put all their energies into him. Greg, we're giving you a new title. You'll be the Destroyer of Worlds. You know, I'm not even sure if the whole idea that he would be part of the rebirth of the universe came from those Thor issues or or from even later things. So anyway, what the cuz why not destroy Galactus? They have to make up, eventually make up a reason why <laughs> people are not destroying him. Um you know, Marvel has too many cosmic people now. So Galactus doesn't even seem quite so powerful anymore. What? Marvel I thought Marvel's uh, cosmic entities were a bit more balanced. Uh, when I was reading, um, oh, what's that big one? Uh, Annihilation. Uh-huh. It felt like the cosmic entities were mostly just guys that were shooting beams or whatever, but they were mostly dudes that were somehow uh-huh. enabled. Like the fact that Star Lord could play any real part, who's just you know a guy who shoots laser pistols, right. had any real significance that are talking raccoon with about the same ability had any real significance kind of put a lot in check whereas here the thing who you know is one fingering out thugs uh can punch galactus really hard in the knee and nothing really happens kind of set a different precedent i don't know but maybe that was all taken away i i'm cosmic marvel is a huge blind spot for me because i tend to find it incredibly dull right well, and I think it does get dull when everybody's powers are powers on top of powers on top of powers. And it seems it's like... fun in this one issue, yeah. you know, like you just said, going from the thing being able to knock out a human being with a little thump of his finger versus he can't do anything to Galactus. So that was a nice bit of scale there. But I've always felt Cosmic Marvel is like the antithesis of what made Marvel popular in the first place uh right the whole idea of setting the world right outside your window all that which more or less has kind of faded away slowly but yeah uh, well there i think there were two marvels there starting maybe around that around this issue there was the cosmic marvel and the world outside your window marvel going simultaneously by the you you got captain marvell coming in and the then they started developing the Kree Empire and the supreme intelligence of the Kree. And they started bringing in all kinds of people, the Stranger and Eternity and 
And even early on, Doctor Strange was kind of like Cosmic Marvel. Um, so I think Marvel's I think Marvel's always been split, and and Thor has often been deep into the cosmos, going off and discovering uh, Ego, the living planet, and the Rigelians who are conquering large parts of the universe somewhere else, and all these things. Right. But then you got Spider Man and Daredevil, and argue I can't disagree that the. The Spider-Man, in a way, is better, but somehow I like the cosmic. Well, and I think if that was true and they had a clearer vision of that, making mm-hmm. the Fantastic Four the bridge really right. makes that more compelling. Yeah, because the Fantastic Four still do have a foot in Manhattan and a sense of some kind of life there, along with their cosmic adventures. Right. Right. And maybe that's, you know, as much as I like Chip Zdarsky's cosmic adventures that he's having right now for the thing in Johnny Storm in Marvel 2 in 1, that we go on for eight issues or whatever with no part of their normal life going on does leave you more feeling un, unrooted a little bit. You know what it is that pulls me out of Chip's run more than anything? What? It's the thing. He gave up. Right. And that feel like, how do you reconcile that moving forward it's the same it's the same problem with the spider-man run with what he did with j jonah jameson it was interesting for a little bit but how do you move forward from that and it's forever going to be a blight on those characters that you can't quite pull back from and he just has no conception of what he's doing it feels like uh the sooner marvel fires him the better is my opinion (laughs) Well, you were kind of liking him for a little while. Yeah, that went away fast. Oh, my. Uh, he's worse than Fraction. I have all these issues of Spectacular Spider-Man piling up that I haven't read yet, but I was looking forward to reading. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no. You don't have to take a lot of responsibility for it. <laughs> um, I make my own foolish decisions easily enough. <laughs> uh, um, what was I going to say? Uh, it seems in general that I find in superheroes when writers forget that they need to be positive actors. They can't get too depressed and self-pitying. There a little bit of that works, but they need to rise above that quickly and act like even one of the good things about Peter Parker is even though he's feeling sorry for himself a lot, he still gets back out of bed and goes and fights another day. Do you mind if I take a tangent off our huge tangent here? Sure, I, take a take. A this note. is something I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, because there's a lot of talk about how you need to, you know, you know, good writing is putting your heroes through absolute hell and all that. Right. And right, that's a well-known cliche. I, I've been seeing so much fan reaction to wanting to see good things happen to these characters that we've been growing with and more than that when they happen the fan reaction stays positive and they're happy right. for it and i'm thinking you know maybe maybe letting spider-man have his marriage is the better right. story you know letting mm-hmm. the fantastic four having some hope is the better story like if you just keep kicking them when they're down there's no there's no up there's no swing there's no story there's no redemptive quality right. there's there's something missing and letting good things happen to people who work hard and deal with negative stuff every day it's kind of like because the closest thing you can equate to in real life really is like firefighters or policemen you know right. they go and they deal with some terrible things in and out we're assuming good cops and right like, good firemen right. Is that they, thing? they they encounter some of the tragedies and worst things that happen in our daily world but that most of us don't see most days of our lives but if they're going to be a super cop if you will you know they're a good person who's dealing with this and maybe has some tough decisions to make on the job but when they come home you know, there might be some tension or some worry about them, but it's a good thing. And it feels so like if they have all that going on in their life, wouldn't they want to be closer to those around them than push them away over not eating a sandwich right. or whatever? Like it just, 
if you go through life with all that negativity, like you need some positivity to balance out. It, it doesn't even feel like emotionally realistic. It doesn't resonate when you keep punching them when they're down like that. Right. You know, and uh, I really noticed that a lot with Rick Remender when he was at Marvel. The characters, like I read his Captain America run and I really liked his X-Force run, but it was so depressing and so down. Right. Is that what it's called? X-Force? Yeah, he did X-Force. That, that jumped into my mind particularly when Captain America was just kind of this beaten loser off in Dimension <laughs> Z. And he just could not get anywhere. He could not gain any traction. And I just was like sick of it because... Yeah, I think there's a problem between characters with problems versus characters who just are defeated over and over again. Right. Whose souls are smashed to the ground. It's it's especially because of the nature of superheroes. You know, are as cheesy as it is our attraction to them is because they they walk on air. They're lighter than the rest of the world. Things can't hurt them as much. Right, which is I and and that's a escapism, I suppose. But it's still it has its value, I think. And I, I've been behind. I'm probably about a year behind now. But uh, Miss Marvel was doing that for me more recently, and I find fun. I find it funny. Some people that push back on. I think some of it is some people who want that darker edge, and I think there just has to be some characters where, you know, things aren't right. that bad all the time. <laughs> Well, Squirrel Girl has Squirrel Girl always... Like, the joke about Squirrel Girl is she's this ridiculous character. I'm talking about the current right. S Squirrel Girl series, because I, I haven't read As her opposed to all, like, yeah. six comics or whatever it was. Right. Like, yeah. Right. But so it's, it's done in a jokey, lighthearted way where Squirrel Girl always wins against whatever odds come up against her, and she's really perky and, and makes ironic jokes about it. Yeah. And I certainly wouldn't want every comic to be that way, but but it's um, good to have the one. It's good to have that, and it's um, since it works for me. But I read it with my daughter, who doesn't see it as tongue in cheek as I do. But oh. the tongue in cheekness is still allows me as an adult to read it, I suppose, and and uh, enjoy its um, very light, easy way she has, but. But there's always some clunk, fun, clever playing with things. And yeah. And so I've heard complaints that one of the flaws of Squirrel Girl is things are too easy for her. So you can't win whatever you do. I well, yeah. It's, what's funny to me, and part of the reason I didn't evoke Squirrel Girl, though I think it's a fine comic. Yeah. Uh, to me, Squirrel Girl is more of a gag book. It's a comedy. Yeah, it said Marvel right. has a superhero trope. In a way, she's but... outside of the Marvel continuity. Yeah, it's she's, it's not like a superhero her, book. It's a it's a comedy. She's book. in another dimension that looks like Marvel continuity. <laughs> yeah, which is fine. Which in some ways is right. a lot of Marvel comics, anyways. So right, right. Well, but it, I noticed this in DC comics and. In general, I feel almost like there's too much depression <laughs> in comic books. Right. I feel like the throw of Watchmen in the 80s and all that dar dour stuff, now that we're allowed to take this seriously, now that the code's more or less been broken, though not fully thrown out, kind of went away. And we've been bouncing back and seeing some of that a little bit. But some of it, too, has come from the super decompression of comics. Like, you can't right. tell a story without calming through so many details. It's like, you, no, Bendis, you can glaze over a few details. It's okay. Right. It's a story. That's true. If a superhero now has a problem, it's going to last for years, whereas it might have lasted for an issue or two before they solved it Right. in some earlier eras. So that emphasizes the negative. But also, I think, because the writers... Because everything's been done, maybe, in a sense. Mm -hmm. They dig deeper and deeper into the the the, the ditches. <laughs> you know, they dig the ditches deeper because they can't think of what else to do. Just make things even worse. Right. Well, and this is where um, I tend to enjoy a lot of Dan Slott's writing. I feel like he has some creative problems. Not every issue is the best, but 
even though he has these long storylines, it feels like the issues move and you deal with different things. And right. he, he, he lets some details glide when he realizes they might be a little too boring to go into. And then someone who might be writing the amazing Spider-Man right now bases his entire run on one little stupid thing that Dan Slott glazed over. That was incredibly <laughs> boring and it's not worth Yikes. digging into. I might have some opinions about Spider-Man right now. Are we talking about Spencer now? Yeah, we're talking, talking about, about the other uh, bad writer that they have on Spider-Man right now at Marvel. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what we need is someone named Matt writing uh, Spider-Man. I couldn't do worse. <sighs> I, uh... I, I have to say, when reading this uh, Galactus trilogy now, I can't help fantasizing about where I would have taken the Silver Surfer and galactus going forward from this point but if i were having to write for marvel now i'd have to deal with all that other stuff that all those other people did well it's a completely different character yeah. you'd almost have to invent a silver surfer like character that would be more alien give him some visual gimmick for people to move past and right. then reintroduce it and tell that story which would be more fresh and fun anyways but it'd be funny because you'd be copying marvel's history to introduce a new character to marvel to go to <laughs> what they were originally intending anyways yeah that's very true well um yeah now i'm i there's lots of individual marvel things that i'm enjoying but they don't hang together well and i and the, the the illusion that they should hang together is perhaps my hang up sometimes and I think we've both thrown a lot of negativity, but I think a lot of it is uh, this weight with the decompression and the price. You know, every issue is a bit more of an investment and it's only a part, you know, I mean, like we read these three issues and really it was, it could have been two, but it was coming off this other story and there's these other elements. And now it's six issues to get through what would have been you know one three or four pages yeah <laughs> right like just too much to be placed on something so like there's a couple moments i didn't love in this galactus story that would have basically been the better part of an issue i would have really hated that issue it would have really brought the whole thing down for me but it's that's a really good point one page you know like ah eh, whatever but then you move past yeah. it it's not it's not the biggest thing and you get the bigger scope and like the point of that thing i didn't love plays to the larger story and you can kind of see the forest through the trees yeah well i think i think writers should really do a lot more one and done or two or three issue stories okay. um and, th and that would really help comics a lot <laughs> totally it would be a lot more work for them i i know i think one way you know certain writers write six comics a month is because they have they write one they're story. Really only writing six stories a year right which they stretch out yeah i agree totally it's there i mean the artist still has to work about as hard but right yeah the artists still work as hard the um i guess the problem is or one of many problems they don't have a monetary motivation to take more time and come up with new stories every issue unless they were paid more per issue well unless you want to argue that it would turn around the quote-unquote failing industry but uh well true true it might be a, a circular thing where and there are people you know dan slot again on his silver surfer i keep coming back to that a lot of that was one and done or short very short little things and i wish more comics more modern comics followed that lead mm -hmm. and i thought at first that tom king on batman was um was doing that well don't marry but yourself to that idea. that all of it is just part of a hundred issue story and i'm like oh god hundred issues so now it all rests on whether that last issue of the hundred issues works a hundred issues that's his plan or that's what how what he's claiming now that he's been planning all along a hundred issue story how much kite man is there gonna be i don't know <sighs> And it's going to go to issue 102 because there were two issues that he didn't really write himself. Which ones? The the Monster Men issues. Oh, some of the decent ones. Okay, let's answer reason. I, those weren't decent, that Monster Men 
storyline was bad today. Oh. <laughs> the war of joke and reels, buddy. We, we've talked that over. Right. <laughs> we can update people who don't watch my videos but listen to this podcast that I now hate Batman too. <laughs> oh, good. After issue 50, where the wedding didn't happen, talk about, I, I think part of me, what it was a very badly done issue, no matter what, what, what you wanted to happen with the wedding of Batman. Wow. But on top of that, I think there was a part of me that says, yeah, let's have, let's have a few more issues where Batman's happy and things are going well for at least some part of his life. What? Um, Even negating the happiness part, which we just talked right. about, the fact that there was what two like like slowly throughout his run but also like two arcs really building to that marriage and then an arc's worth of uh one shots or a mini series i don't know how you want to read that but one and two shot issues leading up to the yeah a whole events worth of books and then right nah it's it's not satisfying I look back, in any there way. Were, there were 26 issues in the between the proposal to the marriage, and most of those in some way or another were supposed to be about whether Catwoman and Batman should get married. <sighs> yeah, and then to just not is... Right. But then Tom King says, don't worry, folks, there's going to be more. It's a 100-issue story. Hang in there keep buying no i'm not gonna hang in there i'll i'll read it from the library someday in trades or something just to see what he did and the go- 50 plus issues in when you count all those tie-ins and whatnot right Oops. and i bought a lot of the tie-ins yeah hang in there no we hung in yeah. there this was supposed yeah. to be a satisfying end even if it's not your final ending you right. gotta right. it was in every way, billed as one of those special issues, including all those bad pinups. Or not the pinups themselves weren't bad. The um, the dialogue, the caption monologues put over the pinups were all hideously bad. But. Right. So uh, that's but that's happy. That's a happy news now. Matt and I are on the same page with Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to find more comics on positive. I keep coming off so negative, and I, I uh, really do love comics. I just well i'm loving tons of indie comics and but some of those will disappoint me in their final issue as killer be killed happened with killer be killed that was a big big belly flop of a final issue on a great series i should note um we've been meaning to get to killer be killed and i put it off a little bit because i was going to go by the trade and uh check it out and then i went to a con expecting to be able to find a trade of a recent image series because right, how can right. you not uh dever comic con is how you cannot and, and the huge con too yeah it's the biggest one of the region but not one copy of killer be killed to be found in that floor well i think it's just as well because now i would say it's not worth our time now i'm too fascinated to find out how this build <laughs> leads to such a disappointing ending i that's not a healthy way. i would say don't get it out of the library or find it very cheap i mean it's an extremely well done comic for 19 issues but it's all one story and the final issue you know so again you're going to be more disappointed by these decompressed stories than the one and dones because if they're bad if the ending is bad you've invested 20 issues in a bad ending and the question and some people are more accepting of the journey versus the ending and i I vary on that but with killer be killed i definitely felt like the ending betrayed the story i have a would you rather would you rather get a bad ending like killer be killed or at least for as i know right now but it's happened in comics before get something like reborn where it's a relatively enjoyable comic but they just leave it on a cliffhanger and near as you can tell you're never going to get another issue Wait, which was Reborn? Was that the Mark Millar? With uh, Capullo. With Capullo. Did that end on a cliffhanger? I mean, I think there's something. But you could tell there's supposed to be more. There's supposed to be a volume two and nothing. Yeah, you know, I guess I had more fun suffering (laughs) or not suffering through the 19 issues of Killer Be Killed. I'd rather reread Killer Be Killed than Reborn. Yeah. I got confused for a second because I was thinking you were talking about Rebirth. I was like, oh, wait. Comic book titles, man. It's easy to get confused. 
Well, there's another thing where a long form story, I think, is really hurt the DC universe because they set up Rebirth with this story about Wally West and issues with the DC universe having been edited and fixed by somebody, probably Dr. Manhattan. And it's two plus years since, and the story has only inched that meta story over the entire universe has only inched forward a teeny bit. Um, Doomsday clock is a long way off from being finished. And I don't know if that will even really tell this story that was started at that point. But I feel like that's hovering over the over rebirth that was at first really good, but because there's this unfinished narrative, everything in in DC Comics is kind of paused and has nowhere to go. I'd argue and say, as someone who's enjoying a lot of rebirth books, uh, a lot of those books just didn't bother with their. A lot of those stories had nothing to do with that, and they still just drop the ball. Well, I but I feel the ball may have been dropped on a editorial level because everyone was waiting to see what Jeff Johns wanted them to do. Does Jeff Johns want you to do something with this character or not? That's just my theory. That's fair. I mean, he does have a little but, too but much But I do control. feel that for about a year, Rebirth was really good. Oh, yeah. But I probably f- felt for about a year, New 52 was really good I, with some obvious exceptions, but. I wonder if a lot of it's editorial. I wonder if a lot of it's just burnout with trying to double ship a lot of these comics. There's that. Of course, New 52 was not double shipped, but it it also seemed to fizzle after a while. There's still a lot of New 52 books that kind of carried through, I feel. So. Or at least had good arcs and then they changed creative and it didn't work. Like, for instance, Wonder Woman was really good till the creative team left and then they put on that. Right. Kind of the reverse of that good creative team and flash had a good creative team on it although with some flaws and then they left like maybe a lot of the new 52 problem was creative teams moving on or being moved away sorry i'm kind of burping as i talk well and like i feel like green lantern had a lot of interesting stuff in the new 52 um Batman was an interesting case, though Batman was half of the new 52, and I think that was the problem. For every good Batman issue, there's two to three bad ones, you know? Uh, uh, maybe that's not so different yeah. now. I I felt that, that Batman, under, or if we're talking about the Snyder, Capullo Batman, that it kind of fizzled in the second half of the new 52. It did, but its fizzle was still interesting and stuff that you still kind of think about in some ways. I think, you know, Gordon Batman and... Uh, the plant stuff and yeah, Mr. Bloom, all that. Like, yeah, Mr. Bloom was a nice looking villain and there was still good Capullo art, but I don't know. It felt felt like the Snyder's worst inclinations took control. Yeah. But I mean, you also had Batman eternal going, you had uh, the Batman Robin run, you know, which is still beloved. Well, I was going to mention the Batman Robin run as, as the most successful from start to finish. Right. So, and there were lots of things that were successful for a time, and yeah, and there's a little more experimental stuff, especially at the beginning. You had your eye vampire and your yeah western, though that western book I don't think ever really went anywhere. Right, and they had um, Frankenstein, Agent of Shade, which I enjoyed a lot, but didn't last too long. Oh, and they even let uh, Didio do uh, what's his name? Oh, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> And that was it was probably the best Dan DiDio comic I've ever read. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've probably dribbled on long enough, but I had a great time. And um, so are you feeling positive on what you want to do next time as your pick? Or are you still thinking about it? I'm good as long as you uh, feel like you can get a copy. I can either read it digitally or I can find my hard copies somewhere. All right. Um, So next time we will be doing Matt Wagner's Trinity, which was that like a mini series or was it just a one shot? I don't know how it was originally released. I just have it as a graphic novel, but yeah, it's, it's the Trinity. That's a book's length, not uh, the, not the latest 52 issue event that I don't know what happened in it. That was a weird book. I own I own Trinity, but I've never read it. It's one of 
of the many things I've collected out of 50 cent boxes and said, hey, that, this is an incredible bargain. Um, so this is good. It'll give me a chance to push forward and read it. Great. So until next time, we will never stay dead. There you go. <laughs>